Pop Shield, a long-form discussion podcast about musical topics both past and present. I'm Gabe, and I'm joined as always by Dan. Hello. And Darren. Hello. Instead of asking you guys what you've been listening to lately, I want to jump right into today's topic and save some time at the end to answer a couple listener emails. And remember, you too can email us at popshieldpod at gmail.com. Now, we've had a lot of Wu-Tang Clan on our minds lately since their backstory has recently gotten both the documentary and the miniseries treatment on Showtime and Hulu respectively. We also realized that we have yet to do a proper hip-hop episode, and when Darren suggested we introduce him to a hip-hop classic he's never heard before, we couldn't resist completely abusing his trust by assigning him the group's (laughs) two-hour-long sophomore LP, Wu-Tang Forever. This album is fascinating for a bunch of reasons that I want to get into, but the number one thing I can never wrap my mind around is why Wu-Tang Forever is so overlooked when it's basically just a giant victory lap by a bunch of the best MCs of all time coming right off of several of the best rap LPs ever. So let's start there. Dan, can you give us a little, you know, the little five minute version of uh, RZA's five year plan, what that was? Yeah. So like RZA gets these group of guys together, you know, which is the Wu-Tang Clan. And he basically, he says that he is the de facto leader. And if they, they, he always uses like this analogy of if they get on the bus, he does the driving, they just shut up and go along for the ride that he, he promised them in five years, he'd take them to the top. Um, and that included, you know, their, their first um, uh, group LP and then some individual solo albums and then this record the uh, Wu-Tang Forever is the sort of last record in that five-year uh, plan era yeah so let me run through it because I don't usually like to spend like a ton of time like doing this encyclopedic background but I think this is really important and it's it's what would have been on people's minds at the time because basically in 1993 You've got Enter the Wu-Tang, 36 Chambers, which is really an undisputed classic, all-time hip-hop classic. Then you've got Method Man's to Cal in 1994, Old Dirty Bastards, Return to the 36 Chambers in 95, Raekwon's Only Built for Cuban Links in 95, Jizz's Liquid Swords in 95, what a fucking year, (laughs) and then Ghostface Killa's Iron Man in 1996, and then, of course, Wu-Tang Clan's Wu-Tang Forever, like you mentioned, in 1997. That's the five-year plan, and that is a handful of absolute classics. So I just want us all to, you know, always remember that the world is just, like, they must have just been waiting, everybody, for this album to drop, because over the course of a few albums in just, like, two, three years... Wu-Tang Clan must have just seemed like absolutely flawless, you know, like they had just taken over rap um, in some ways. Now, Darren, what is your previous familiarity with this kind of first phase, like classic era Wu? So I'm definitely familiar with Enter the Wu-Tang. Um, you know, I came mm-hmm. I came into it much later than than you guys did, but I, I definitely like love that album. It's a great album. Of these okay. like solo records, um, you know, I'm familiar with Jizz's Liquid Swords um and also Raekwon's only built for Cuban links. Uh those are mm. pretty much the only two. I haven't listened to like Method Man or Old Dirty Bastards records. Okay, so that's I mean those are probably those are the big 3, wouldn't you say, Dan? Yeah, yeah, for sure. I think actually we might have done Liquid Swords on our previous podcast, which is kind of a uh, kind Did of interesting. I yeah, maybe. I actually completely forgot about it. I think we all picked like a favorite rap album or something like that. Um so, a little bit of familiarity. Dan, what is your previous familiarity with the Wu in general? Uh I'm a, I'm a huge fan. Uh the computer I'm recording this on has a Wu-Tang sticker on it. I uh okay. <laughs> I, I I love them. I've, I've been a fan basically as soon as I got into rap, I kind of got into it like through 36 Chambers and you know, I, 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 I love all those solo records. Um, and I love, uh, the, uh, you know, 36 chambers, this one. So I'm a big fan. Yeah. I also am a, you know, I, I was, I am and was an extremely obsessed fan to the point where I was like checking out, you know, the like really shitty, like, you know, C tier, like yeah. solo <laughs> albums and stuff like that. Um, and trying to convince myself they were just as good and stuff like that. And, you know, I would say weirdly when it comes to Wu-Tang Forever, maybe just because it's so huge, I still to this day feel like I haven't spent enough time with it, which is kind of why I wanted to do this. Um, 
are you like a lover of this album, Dan? Or are you kind of in the same boat? No, I kind of agree with you, you know, because it is so like like 36 Chambers. I like pretty much know every word like on that record. And yeah. um, I don't I don't think there's a single song I can uh, recite the entire thing of on, on this record because just it, it is so like mammoth. Um, so, yeah, I, I was looking forward to it as well for the same reason. All right. Well, let me just hit you with a, uh, a side question here. Could you can you quickly give your off the top of your head your top five Wu-Tang projects? Uh, yeah, I actually, I, I, I ranked the five-year plan because I knew you'd ask me. So I'll just, I'll just do the whole five-year. Obviously, uh, oh, I should start at the bottom. I was going to start at number one. Um, <laughs> I, the number seven, to Cal Method Man. Surprisingly, okay. kind of the, you know, it's, it's a little weak. Uh, then Wu-Tang Forever, this record. Um, Return to the 36 Chambers. Only Built for Cuban Lynx. Iron Man. Liquid Swords. And then, of course, number one, 36 Chambers. Wow. You know, I, um... I thought about this a little bit, and I, I guess I broke the rules because I didn't just do the classic era, and I sort of surprised myself by coming up with, and I'll, I will do it in one to five order, um, Only Built for Cuban Links, I think, is the best Wu-Tang project like by a mile. Then I'm going Liquid Swords, and then I'm going Enter the 36 Chambers. Oh, man. Is that, is that crazy? And then I'm going Supreme Clientele, and then... I'm going fish scale, which is, oh. which was such a big ass deal at the time. And it just feels like everybody's forgotten it, but I, yeah. I, I love it. Um, anyway. Okay. So I want to come back to why Wu-Tang forever isn't usually considered on the same level amongst the rest of this, like first phase, but first let's dive into the record itself. Darren, can you do your best job of describing the overall sound of this mammoth two hour record? Well, you know, I kind of think the way you sort of described it early on is like a, you know, a, a victory lap with all of some of the greatest MCs, right? So, like, uh, you know, I think that you've got, you know, RZA's production style. So, if I guess if you're not familiar with that, um, you know, the way I hear it is I hear a lot of, like, kind of like live instrumentation along with, like, samples from maybe, like, kung fu movies here and there. Uh -huh. Um, and then just different, you know, rappers basically rapping, you know, multiple verses, like almost every song feels like there's, you know, three or four, sometimes five, sometimes nine verses, <laughs> <Yeah>. right? <laughs> um, uh, you know, and it, 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 it kind of just feels like classic hip hop, I guess. And this is like obviously coming from somebody who's just not as big of a fan of it all like you guys are. But um, when I think of like classic hip hop, I think of like sort of like this, just straight, you know, lyrics, like tons and tons of lyrics. You know what I mean? Like, yeah, not a whole lot of chorus, not a whole lot of like the sort of Jay-Z stuff or whatever, you know, none of that Eminem whatever this is like <laughs> <laughs> this is lyrics you know this mc and right yeah <laughs> just bars <laughs> yeah okay so you raise a bunch of like really interesting points that i want to spend a little time on um as far as the production goes you know it is weird because rizza is associated with a very grimy murky kind of minimalist style usually like it's like the most skeletal kind of like back alley drum beat and kind of like low bass line and then there'll just be this like tinkling piano you know that's maybe just like two notes back and forth the whole time um something very like hard gritty minimalist about it here though it's a bit different in the sense that there is this live instrumentation you mentioned um a lot of people describe this as being like very clean and very grand production wise would you agree with that dan yeah i mean it it like you said the the, the grittierness of, of what you think of like older rizza um things you know most of the solo records 36 chambers definitely yeah it, it always sort of had like this garage sort of it, like it, yes. it, it it's always like reminded me of like garage rap where here it sounds like they moved up from the garage to a like real studio um so there is like i mean i i feel like the um uh, the grimy like sort of attitude and everything is still there but it's definitely like cleaned up you know it's like when when you know uh, we, we always talk about like when a band get gets a little money and they you know they leave the bedroom and, and everything I, I feel like it's sort of uh the same thing here just maybe not to like as much of a detriment as that usually happens for uh, bands we talk about yeah you know I, i'm kind of torn because 
I remember the like when I heard this for the first time back in the day, you know, it was probably um it was probably like the first thing branching out of that, you know, first phase, right? For a lot of people, it's probably the same way. And I was struck by how much cleaner it was. You know, I, I listened to I was listening to, you know, a lot of the first phase stuff over the past two weeks. Um and I, I just like was amazed at how lo-fi it really is. And yet this album, it, I have a hard time calling it clean. I, I used to think it was clean and it sounds pretty gritty to me. I mean, if you compare it to something that like came out the same year, which I want to talk about later, but this, you know, another double rap LP, uh, Biggie's Life After Death, that sounds really grand. Like that has like full string arrangements and stuff like that. And it sounds just l- luxurious. Whereas... This is still pretty gritty, like the in classic Wu Tang style, like all the mics are distorting <laughs> yeah. and stuff, you know, like they sound like live mics instead of proper condenser mics or something. Um, Darren, would you describe this as gritty or very clean? I mean, I would describe it mostly as like gritty. I mean, I, I still think that a lot of the beats are relatively, you know, like a basic beat, you know, like they pretty much stick to a, a, a very, you know, familiar tempo the entire time you know there's not a whole lot of like changes like you would like i imagine in like notorious big's sort of records right um right you know i think of like a song like and maybe it's just because it's so sprawling this or the so long this album you know there's a little bit of everything right but i think of like a song way down on the second side or the second part of the album duck season where it's just like just a beat and like one little like maybe like a guitar lick or something that just repeats yeah. over and over and over again. And to me, that's like, that's the sound. You know what I mean? Like that is quintessential Wu-Tang, I guess. I don't know. Yeah, but there's something really weird about it because the, you know, I guess there's there's always a minimalism to the Wu-Tang stuff, but there there are a lot of like subtle kind of changes where like the beat drops out or like a new thing comes in. You know, I think about like, God, I was listening to uh, 36 Chambers, um, earlier today and like shame on a n-word <laughs> song um you know it's got like this kind of funky beat and then all of a sudden there's like this thelonious monk sample like ding 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 you know what i'm talking about dan like mm-hmm. out, of, out of nowhere with like these weird discordant jazzy chords and like the beats actually change a lot um here it just feels like it is a single loop and it it goes you know it just goes and loops and nothing changes about any of the beats and that made me kind of think about what you were saying, uh, Darren, where it's like there's a throwback vibe to this, which is like, like, that's what you would do. You would just mm-hmm. get a loop going and then all these guys would take turns kind of like battle rapping. Yeah. You know? Doesn't yeah, it feel yeah. like it's kind of evoking that era, Dan? Yeah. Yeah, of course. I, I've been watching. Uh, there's like that Netflix show. Uh, it's Hip Hop Evolution, I think. The okay. like new season came out and I, I've been watching it. And I really like was uh, thinking about that because, you know, they were showing like people, you know, in the streets with a boom box and, and doing exactly what uh, you just said. And, you know, that that is like sort of what you think of with the Woo and especially this record, because, you know, 36 Chambers. Uh, almost all the songs like you know they they'll have three four you know there's obviously a few have uh a bunch more or, or everybody but here i feel like almost every track on this is like a posse cut except for the the um what is it there three or four uh solo tracks yeah um, but you know like almost everything has at least like four or five people on it um so i think you you really get that sense of like you know just some guys hanging out you know on the streets or in someone's basement or, or something like uh uh, passing the mic around yeah and yet you know I, I this whole past two weeks i was just struck by what i see as like kind of contradictory aims with this album and i want to kind of turn to that more specifically in a little bit but you know like i was just saying it's like the production feels like an attempt to step it up and be more grand and bring real instruments in into things you know reunited has like a freaking fiddle solo yeah, or something yeah. you know and <laughs> Everything feels like let's let's like turn it up. And yet at the same exact time, it feels like let's just simplify everything. Let's make the beats really practical. So it it's all about the bars, you know, like there are, you know, so th- like I'm like, so what are you trying to accomplish there? And then I think about stuff like on 36 Chambers, and I think Riz is kind of famous for this, but he would basically force these guys to compete against each other, mm-hmm. like in a very literal sense, where if you want to make this track, you got to win your spot you know and that's why on 36 chambers there are tracks with like you know you just sort of imagine that like 
there's one person on some tracks because uh they won the whole thing you know like he, he's just not going to worry about oh let me make sure i get a little bit of this guy and a little bit of this guy you know like there's like you god is on like one song he has one verse, he has, yeah <laughs> yeah and you know it's awesome but it just feels like that's the only time he won you know i know that the song method man is named after uh method man but it feels like he just dominated that that beat you know, and that's why he got it to himself. Ghostface Killer gets tears to himself. It feels like he just won it, you know? And here it feels... So we were saying it, it's got this battle rap feel, Wu-Tang Forever. And yet, doesn't it feel a little bit more like, let's make sure everybody gets a turn? Yeah, the let's everybody get a, get a turn thing a lot. And I mean, maybe it's because it's so sprawling, but like, we're getting a lot of B-team here, you know? Uh, yeah, yeah. You got having one verse on uh, 36 Chambers was a, uh, was, a, was a good move. Um, I don't really need more than that from him. Um, but we're getting a ton of them here. Uh, we're getting a lot of Master Killer, <laughs> which I, I'll give him, Master Killer basically wasn't in the Wu-Tang until most of 36 Chambers was already uh, like written right, and recorded. Right. Um, but you know, we're getting a lot more of him. We're getting a lot of uh, more inspect the deck. Um, you know, it, th- th- there's a lot more B team. It Riz is even taking, you know, uh, what Riz only has, a f- like a few verses on 36 chambers. He's on a, a, you know, a good deal of it here. Yeah. Let me actually, um, I, I went ahead and like wrote this down. Um, and it's a little imperfect because every member seems to have like a chorus or an intro or a sort of just jump in for a second. So it's sometimes not clear, like what counts as a verse uh, and what doesn't. And like, sometimes these little appearances can make people feel more present than they actually are. The lengths are also sometimes, you know, different, but here is the breakdown of the verses. Okay. Raekwon, 13 verses. He's at the top. All right. Sounds good. Right. Method man, 12 verses next. Okay. All right, Ghostface Killer, eleven verses. Even though he doesn't show up till the end of the fourth song, which is a little a little odd, but um, okay, RZA, eleven verses. A little a little surprising, tied with Ghostface, but he's a, he's a great rapper. Yeah, right? yeah. Here's where it gets a little fucky. Okay, you God, nine verses. <laughs> okay, he doesn't show up till track seven, but he later gets a song entirely um, to himself. I can't okay? wait. It's to, a terrible, yeah, terrible I can't wait song. to talk about that song. <laughs> okay, up next, Inspect a Deck, eight verses all right he also gets a long song to himself and a production credit even though i really like uh the his production on that track up next master killer with seven verses up next jizza with five verses arguably the best pure lyricist mm-hmm. in the group has five verses capadonna tied with jizza five verses he's not even like really really in the group and last odb who's constantly in and out of jail and having drug problems uh <laughs> it really fucking sucks because you just feel like every album after 36 chambers would be better with more odb but he only gets four verses and they're usually very short even though he does get one song to himself so darren i know you're not like the you know foremost expert in wu-tang to the point where maybe you can't even tell when you know when like master killer is rapping over inspected deck but did you feel like, you know, there was a lot of sort of second tier rapping going on? Like, could you tell when Ghostface jumps in versus you, God? Yeah, I, I could definitely tell like when Raekwon for sure. Like, I, I feel yeah. like I, I really know Raekwon. I really know RZA. Like, I, I actually really love RZA, like all over this yeah, record. Yeah, yeah. Um, There's a lot of character in his voice. Yeah, yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, like capadonna and like you god master kill it like i i don't know that was that was tough to really like really i, I had to like look at the wikipedia to know like oh, okay this is master kill it happening right now okay <laughs> yeah inspect a inspect a deck right um <laughs> right. I, I thought he was I, I thought he was great you know what i mean I, I did read that like you know he he has a great verse on triumph so i guess i was kind of very familiar with that first yeah. verse on triumph you know yeah, I want to I want to like spend some time talking about Triumph, but you know, before we get to it, Triumph feels like a legitimate, you know, everybody's on it and yet it really feels like they are fired up and fighting and that Inspector Deck earned the first mm-hmm. verse on that track because it actually is amazing. And Inspector Deck is always good for like one or two great verses. Yeah. You know, he like he's yeah. like that player that comes off the bench and just is like, you know, puts up 10 or whatever before, you know, he just plays like a few minutes and he's great. You know, like you said, Dan, I love I love that like one or two you got appearances on um, Thirty Six Chambers because he's got like a cool deep like sort of 
you know, funky style, funky flow sort of a thing. But I mean, this is, this is a little rough. You know what I mean? Dan, we're like, basically you God has like double the verses of Jizza. Yeah. That, that's a, that's a shame. I don't, I don't know. The Jizza just sort of seems like, and maybe, maybe it's his demeanor and everything. He like, seems like he's, he's a little lazy, you know, like he, he's, mm-hmm. he's so, he's so good, but like, I mean, we've been waiting on dark matter that album for like fucking 15 <laughs> years and stuff and then like pretty much everything f- after 36 he's sort of like not he, he's he's always like not there that you know for the a team he's always the like one who has the least amount of verses um you know even like liquid swords like almost every single track has like multiple other people on it you know um yeah but yeah i mean it, it is really a shame that we have more you got here because like you said i thought i thought what you said about inspector deck was was really good like he he is that like he's underrated and i like him but he he could never carry like a whole record himself and i think that's why he doesn't have a classic you know solo record from that era i don't even think he had one until like much much later at all because because he's he's great as that like you know person who comes in kills a verse or two and then you know he's back out uh it's great but yeah, I mean, you just don't need that much of him. And uh, and then, you know, Master Killer, he just always sort of seems like, oh, yeah, like Rizzo wanted a certain number of people in the group, you know? like Yeah, and he kind of just sounds like like he's copying Jizza, but he's too slow. Yeah, and yeah, yeah exactly. Surgical. Like like uh, like Capadonna sounds like the bootleg Ghostface, and uh, yeah, Master yeah. is the is the bootleg uh, Jizza. Yeah, so Wait, you know that. Can I that, ask? A, can I ask a question real quick? Yeah, like maybe you guys can kind of help me understand. You know, because I don't know as much history wise, but like you know, this is like 1997, right? So they've they've had all the success with all these solo albums and stuff. Like, is is it is everybody just like in a different place? You know what I mean? Like, it, or, you know, are they just not? That's how, sort how of they, how are they functioning as a group, right? Because like yeah, even that, that that article that you sent, Gabe, sort of seemed to suggest that like at this point they were just in a very different place individually you know what i mean yeah that's sort of where like the problem arises because you know 36 chambers and all but before the success everybody was on you know sort of level playing ground and you know all got on this bus did did riz's uh doing but yeah like at this point like ray and ghost are like pretty big and you know method man's like a huge star and then you know inspect the deck you got master killer never reached that level you know old dirty bastards like on mtv doing crazy shit all the time you know right. but like i don't think anybody unless they're like a big big enough to like know all the members of the wu-tang clan know who inspect the deck you got or master killer or probably capadonna are you know yeah and you know i've read that like method man kind of described he's described like coming back to the group and being excited to sort of share the stuff he's been up to, you know, and nobody really caring because they have their own thing going on. Um, and I, I just you feel like when you watch like early interviews or when you listen to 36 Chambers, like they are all so into the Wu-Tang Clan, mm-hmm. you know, like right. they love the Wu-Tang Clan. And all these interviews are constantly like, yo, this is what the Wu-Tang Clan means. You know, this is what it represents. And like they're like every time somebody jumps in, you know, you're just you're just always feeling like, OK, ODB is about to say some crazy shit that nobody <laughs> understands. But they all like nod. They're like, hell yeah, that's so true. <laughs> you know, like this, uh, and like and then, it, it, you know, from what I understand, they kind of come back and they come back together. And, and also there's sort of an interesting thing that's actually it's very bizarre but like basically when rizza arranges uh the record deal for the wu-tang clan he somehow you know finagles this deal where the members are allowed to go and just sign their own labels and like be you know bring the wu-tang clan with them uh with the original label like having no control over that or whatever so it just feels like everybody's like really on their own you know like Mm -hmm whatever like probably method man got like the biggest advance or whatever and you know because he was the biggest star so maybe there's just some jealousy arising and stuff they're just really like i don't know but it feels like they come together and they're not totally on the same page so it's weird because there are these tensions and yet it doesn't feel like the fiery it it like sounds like battle rap but it doesn't feel like the fiery battle rap spirit that made 36 chambers so great now before we move on darren I want you to give your best shot 
of um, describing the the sound and style of each member individually. Go ahead. Oh my god! <laughs> I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. <laughs> okay, I, I, I wanted. I kind of wanted to do this, uh, but I, I feel like we won't have enough time to do it. Um, you know, between me and Dan. But how would we describe sort of the rapping in general? We've talked about it a little bit, but I'm wondering, like, you know, we're we're, we're getting to this, but does it does it gel? I mean, do they feel like? You know, the quietest article that you mentioned, Darren, it says that it sort of feels like just ten, like a vehicle for 10 or, you know, nine solo projects. Does it feel that way to you? Or do you feel like they're they're in it together? Do you feel like some songs are in it together? What's going on? Yeah, I mean, I feel like <clears throat> I feel like some songs, they are all in it together. But what I don't I guess my closest comparison are like some of Kanye West's tracks, right? And I'm thinking of like off of uh, Twisted Fantasy, um, like So Appalled, uh, tracks that have like four or five different rappers on it where yeah, yeah. you're kind of like listening and it just really seems like certain rappers like just stand out so far above others, you know what I mean? Like there's, I don't know, there's just something different in tracks like that. Here, I just feel like everybody is like doing a great job. Like they're already pretty good i mean f- you know obviously forget some of the c tier guys that you mentioned but like when it's like raekwon and like ghostface and like rizza like they all just have a great verse and i don't really think about the v- previous verse before that or whether it's okay. like better or not you know what i mean like it's just it all kind of just go you know they're all pretty like level i guess is how i would describe it yeah yeah that's i, I think that's actually very interesting because you know, sort of jumping ahead to a, something I want to talk about later as we get into like the individual tracks. But you know, the track "The MGM," uh, which is kind of buried in the second disc, it's it's got this kind of throwback RZA production style, which is actually really funny because it's not produced by him; it's produced by True Master. We should say that there are, are actually a couple of tracks that RZA's proteges uh, produce, and they often do a better job of sounding like RZA <laughs> you know, than, than RZA does. Um, so he trained them really well, but. That track in particular, it's got that like classic only built for Cuban links vibe of Ray and Ghost. They're the only ones on the track and they're kind of jumping back and forth. Yeah, like, the, two bars, the one trading. bar, one bar, two bar. Yeah, there, there's almost none of that anywhere else on yeah. the album. You know what yeah. I mean? Yeah, that, that song, I like, I sort of like wonder is that like a leftover from Cuban links and stuff? Because it, it sounds yeah. so much like cuban links uh you know with the trading back and forth which like ghost and ray are like the best team you know uh-huh, uh-huh. yeah and also i feel like do you feel like there's a difference dan in the way they're rapping like you know maybe it's hard to talk about the lyrical themes even though i want to try a little bit but it, it feels to me like compared to 36 chambers where it's very like energetic. They found they sound very hungry, fired up. They also sound like they're doing a lot of like hyping and like chanting, you know, like mm-hmm. stuff that you could shout along to uh, at at a show. Um, here, it's like I, I, you're just struck immediately, I think, by how dense the lyricism is, like how you know poetic it is. Um, it, like mature is that how you would describe it dan yeah i think mature is like a is a great way to say it you know like 36 chambers and it kind of goes back to like i said like that whole like garagey sort of feel like everyone seems in the best use of the term like a little amateur you know like like it, it's not a negative at all but here you know yeah. everybody's gotten like a little better ghost is sort of getting into like what he'll do on supreme clientele where he's just like it's a uh, like free association and like yeah 90, like a foreign language yeah almost. like 99 percent of the time i have no idea what the fuck he's talking about <laughs> right, and right. you know and like even rizza like does that some you know he's like starts talking about like implanting chips and whatever crazy shit he believes and uh like <laughs> you know I, I don't know what the fuck he's talking about so like <laughs> yeah. you know all that like is very different from from 36 chambers and i think it is just like uh, from confidence of like you know becoming successful and just like you know pure you, you know they've done nothing but Skill. this for yeah f- for five years you know they, they're honing a craft and i think like by this point they have like you know i, I think I, by this point like everybody sort of has like their this is what they you know ghost ghost tells his weird stories that you know sound like a foreign language you know uh ray's gonna talk about the streets and you know some weird mafia shit like everybody's sort of got their like lane by this sort uh, of time you know 
Yeah, I think that's actually a pretty good way of describing because it, it just feels like there's enough room for everything to be included. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Like, um, you know, Enter the Wu-Tang just feels like, the, you know, there's an established theme and trying to establish themselves. Um, whereas here it's like, that's already, that's over with now. Everybody has established themselves mm-hmm. and every song, the reason why this is like a double album, it almost feels like is like, there's just so much room for everybody to just get everything out there so that it kind of feels, I don't know, to me, it just doesn't really feel all that focused really. Like I can't, I don't really know what the theme is like going through all of these tracks. You know what I mean? I don't, I don't even know if they really relate to one another. I mean, is is there something like that that I'm missing? Uh, yeah, you know, I honestly, I feel kind of like, like, I don't think this is true, but it sounds like they all just recorded their verses at their own home studio, and then they were just pieced together after the fact, because they don't feel <laughs> yeah. like they have much relationship. Yeah. And yet, at the same time, you know, talking about these contradictions, it feels like the verses themselves are so labored over, you know, where this is like some of the most impressive rapping I've ever heard. And the verse will stretch on for so long and it'll just be like, like I said, absolutely so dense that you feel like I would need to listen to this a hundred times to like unlock everything. It actually goes so fast. If you try to follow on genius, like you can't, (laughs) you know, I can't even, I can't even read the lyrics fast enough, let alone read the annotations while reading the lyrics fast enough. There's stuff like that just amazes me where there's so much internal rhyming, you know, where it's like the, the middle word of the bar rhymes with like, you know, the last word of the next bar, you know, it's not like just basic everything's lining up all the time yeah there's even like blank verse where it's not even rhyming anymore and it's still flowing just perfectly um did you find yourself darren like kind of i mean whenever i put this record on after i get through the first track which we'll talk about um i'm just bowled over by how good the rapping sounds yeah i when i was mentioning that everybody just sounded really great or sounded level I mean, what I'm saying is that, like, they sound like the greatest rappers of all time, just (laughs) showing up and, you know, spitting their verse in their style, and it's just amazing almost every single time. Like, I I can't think of anything from, like, Raekwon, Method Man, um, like, RZA, anything that I felt like was, like, weak (laughs) at all. Like, they were, they're, like, all superstars, you know what I mean? Like, on every, every time they appeared to me. So, I guess that goes to your point about, like, laboring over the the verses because it really does i mean it everything flows so perfectly and i'm i don't know i guess like by by about like the halfway point of the record i'm just i guess i'm no longer being surprised because it's like yeah these are just they're all always going to be great like the whole record through there's not there's nothing really weak coming from like the top guys you know what i mean yeah just a maintained like very high level um and just again, like these, the production, which sounds grand and yet is so practical just to serve like these absolutely dense labored over verses, um, you know, really strange uh, on that note, something that I think you really end up missing, you know, if you've listened to 36 chambers first, which I can't imagine there's a human being who didn't, um, is the, like the hooks, right? There's almost no hooks. And We'll talk about this, but obviously RZA is very opposed to like R&B rap and bullshit where you just have like somebody singing the chorus in between rap verses. And yet Enter the 36 Chambers is full of hooks, you know, like you can you want to shout along like bring the motherfucking ruckus. You know, it's like fun. You know, it's a chorus in a sense. Um, You know what I mean, Dan? There's like almost none of that. No, I think and, and I don't know this to be true or anything, but I think that like it, it feels like maybe part of like Riz's plan was he knew that they would like go on a tour and they did. And, you know, so like the way to like get a crowd going is to have stuff. I mean, Wu-Tang Clan ain't nothing to fuck with is like, you know, people still yell that, you know, to the, to this, right, you know, right. 20 something years later. Um, you know, it's just like the, all those songs are like so perfect for like the live, uh, arena, you know? Um, and I feel like he had to have, he's so, he's so like, brilliant and stuff and you know this whole thing is like his idea that he had to have he had to have thought of that and i think like by by wu-tang forever you know we're past that and it this is like sort of that victory lap so now we don't really need the hooks we don't need those 
those th- things to yell out. In, in fact, like I saw the, the Wu Tang um, like th- two, three years ago, and I don't think they played anything from this record uh, off the top <laughs> of my head. You know, it was like ninety nine percent thirty six chambers, and uh, you know, a couple Liquid Sword songs. Yeah, you know, and it's it's uh, along with that like really dense rapping. There isn't a lot of stuff that you can even you even find yourself like saying along. You know, mm-hmm. it, you talked about thirty six chambers. You just kind of can't help but kind of say the lines with them when you're listening. And there's stuff where it's just so hooky. It feels like I always think about um, you know when ODB says like the Brooklyn Zoo line. Yeah, <laughs> on thirty six chambers, it's so much fun that somebody had the the wisdom to be like that should be the chorus of another hit song you know like (laughs) it's just a tossed off like end of a bar or whatever um and it becomes the entire hook of a song and i feel like there are so many just lines that are so good that they become hooks you know like you find yourself sort of um they just stick in your mind and because the lyricism is so dense here you don't you don't get any of that. So how do you feel about that like trade off, Darren? Where it's like, okay, you don't get the fun shout along stuff, but you do get like straight up poetry. Yeah, and I think I probably prefer the the more poetry side of things. Like it, it's almost uh-huh. like the equivalent of like I don't know jamming like in a <laughs> a rock band, right? Just like really like long. Yeah, you know, songs that just don't have choruses or anything like that, and they're just jamming, you know, whatever post rock type of stuff. Um, I found myself really enjoying that. Like, I, I, I kind of marveled at how amazing all of these people are. You know, like I've listened to, you know, plenty, like my, you know, plenty of hip hop albums and stuff. Generally, like a solo artist, most of these albums, not, not too many like group albums, right? So this is like. Kind of was just blowing my mind the whole time that I was, you know, had no idea that all of these guys, or so many of them, were, like, among the greatest of all time. You know what I mean? It's it's like a, I don't know, it's like an all-star group. So, I I guess, you know, and when I had always thought about Wu-Tang, I guess I sort of just assumed that they were just a bunch of, like, individual people who, you know, at one point called themselves the Wu-Tang Clan, but became amazing on their own but like i don't know to hear them all like come together like this i I was just kind of like floored and i i think i would sort of prefer just hearing them do their thing like this and be kind of like just marvel at that you know what i mean yeah wow so that's actually very interesting so first off it's funny that you mentioned the jamming thing because um you know it's like i I jotted down here that it it feels like i'm listening to the grateful dead or something where it's like (laughs) this is just virtuosity you know like this is pure every verse is just you know ghostface showing how fucking good he is and you know it's like guitar solos you know and <laughs> it, it it gives this it gives the whole album something like a it's hard to stay focused and stay connected because it's kind of cool to just have on in the background or something right you know, like tune in and out mm-hmm. as you please um another thing that i is kind of amazing that you just sort of made click for me um is that you know isn't it bizarre that really like the wu-tang clan is a band let's say they go solo and then by their second album it has the feel of a super group you know what i mean dan like isn't yeah that fucking no weird? it is really weird because yeah they they feel exactly like a super group you know if you just woke up today you know you didn't know anything about them you heard this record you would assume that this is like some super group but yeah it's crazy that like how did how did like not only did like Rizza f- happen to find these people who would become some of the greatest MCs, but like he's related to <laughs> to two of them, you know. Like it- it's just, I-, I don't know if it's like just sheer practice or just luck or or what. But yeah, it's a- it's like really nuts to get. I mean, at least everybody but uh, you know three of them are kind of like the best rappers ever. You know, it's it's weird. Yeah, yeah. So. Let's. I'm, I want to come back to sort of some of the lyrical content. Maybe when we get into like the, you know, you, you mentioned it, Darren, but like, is it possible we're missing some like grand overarching theme to this thing? Um, but let's talk about some highlights. You know, Triumph is, you know, pretty much unanimously considered like the greatest song here. I think it would be hard to argue that it's not the greatest song here. But a lot of people even claim it's like the single 
masterpiece here. How do you guys feel about that? I mean, it is definitely the best track on this record, but it's not the sole masterpiece. There, there's plenty of of great songs. Um, I do find it weird that Triumph is like opens the second track. Like, I feel like yeah, like I really like um, uh, Reunited. Uh, but uh, I would I would switch the two. Reunited is like the second tier triumph. You know that would be a great start for the second disc. Um, yeah. So I, I'd switch that around. But there, there's like plenty of uh, of great songs. I like for heaven's sake a lot. Even though I mean that song's crazy because that's all B team. Um, you know yes. If- if Isn't you it? said, you know, if you said, oh, the 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 Inspector uh, Master Killer Capadonna track is uh, one of the best <laughs> on there, I'd say, well, you're fucking crazy. But no, it really is. Yeah. Like that's a really good song. Um, but do you kind of wonder, like, if it's just because of the beat? It is. You know, like the uh, beat is so good. Yeah, maybe. I I love that like sample in it. Um, yeah. Yeah. Th- there's plenty of of like quote unquote masterpieces on on this record. You know. Well, what do you think about Triumph? Darren, do you feel like it stands out amongst everything else here? I mean, I think it does because it's really the only one that has like, you know, a gargantuan nine verses on it, right? Um, and, yeah. and it kind of like, so it kind of collects exactly what we were sort of talking about, you know, all of this like sort of like poetry and this like idea of like jamming and puts it all into one song and gives you nine different people like rapping. And it's, it's just such a treat, you know hearing everybody one after another you know what i mean and even the the you know c-tier guys sound good on this track because i don't know it just seems to it seems to all work right there's really not a moment that i'm like you know well that wasn't that great or whatever yeah Um, i feel like they really brought it like they earned their spot obviously like the concept of the song is that everybody's going to be there but you know i i almost like to believe that if you didn't if you didn't make a good enough verse like sorry you're just not going to be on it and everybody brought like one of their best verses here um it also kind of functions as like almost almost like the mission statement of this album Mm -hmm. which is why i think i agree with you dan where it should kind of start the whole thing because it's like the absolute you know just nailing the idea of like uh, the beat is a little bit, you know, it, it's it's grand. It's got strings and horns on it. It's sort of just a loop, and yet there's a little bit of fluctuation, you know, as it switches from the strings to the horns. It's really glorious. It's named Triumph, and it feels like a takeover of the rap industry or something. It feels like a victory lap. It's also got like a, it's just so badass that it was basically a hit, and it's six minutes long with no chorus and no hook whatsoever, you know? And it feels like a genuine like radical challenge to popular you know mainstream rap to just be like we don't need fucking choruses and it really really works here you know in a way that i i just i I do feel like transcends the rest of the album but let's talk about some of these other highlights were there other highlights for you darren yeah i mentioned it before but like i think duck season might be like my favorite track on the whole uh Record. Yeah, I love that beat. Um, yeah. Love the beat. You know, you've got like Raekwon and like RZA. You know, like my familiarity with RZA really was like mostly his appearance on um, like on Kanye's record, which was like he's barely there, right? And so I had, right. and I remember you telling me a long time ago, like, no, man, like you know, RZA is great, blah blah blah. I had no idea, but this this record like really sort of changed that. Um, I mean, I I like uh, <sighs> I really I really think. That song Maria is just so raunchy, but um, <laughs> yeah. I could not help but continue like going back to it because I just thought it was it's 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 great. Um, uh, what else? Gosh, pretty much all of the the first half of the record, I, I can't really dispute anything. I, I wasn't like a huge fan of "It's Yours." Um, okay, I feel uh, like it's got a nice like con- you know closing kind of yeah grandiosity i you know i also feel like heaters works the same way on the second disc like is a great closer and then for some fucking reason it goes into black shampoo oh, um <laughs> it should basically have just ended there but yeah it's got like a nice a nice um conclusion i did want to mention something about you know maria which feels like you know it feels like it sort of comes out of the mind of odb right uh, because he is disgusting and <laughs> i feel like dog shit is another highlight for me because at that point in the record you know like sort of that back half slog you really need some energy and it actually delivers by hitting you with the mgm i mentioned earlier dog shit which is just a fucking delight to hear 
ODB like actually unleashed on his own solo track here. And then Duck Season, like you mentioned. Um, so really a bunch of great highlights here. But do you feel like, you know, there's a lack of fun? We talked about like lack of chanting and that kind of style, but a lack of humor, a lack of silliness, you know, because it's there's I was thinking like there's not enough ODB here, but actually nobody is being that funny. You know, I was listening to 36 Chambers today and like I just could not help but like start laughing when uh like jizza is like you know what's that in your pants oh human feces <laughs> you know like where are these funny fucking lines you know what i mean dan yeah i mean you know meth is usually pretty funny and he's he's yeah. got a couple like he says like uh i do whatever i marijuana which is uh like that's a funny <laughs> yeah. line on this record but yeah like he's even subdued but I, I, but i think like yeah uh, odb being sort of absent I mean, he he's the one who is the crazy, you know, fun, um, you know, just saying nutso shit all the time kind of thing. So when when he's and maybe maybe that's why everyone else like didn't, you know, he's not there coming up with crazy shit. So you know, maybe it didn't inspire them to or something. But but now, yeah, I, I feel you. It, the, this record is like a lot less uh, fun and silly, and uh, there, there's no, there's no uh, comedic relief really. <laughs> yeah, and it, I think it could really use it, but. Again, that trade-off, you know, you get something like uh, Ghostface's legendary verse at the end of Impossible, um, which is like, I think that uh, RZA said it's his favorite uh, verse in all of Wu-Tang history, and, you know, I think the source named it the best verse of that year and stuff, and you just immediately know why, because it's like this stunning stream of consciousness basically explaining like his firsthand just account and reactions to his friend getting shot, you know, all the way up until he dies, I guess. And, you know, you just follow his mind as he like remembers stuff, notices stuff, you know, takes new information in whatever. And it is just, it, it, it's just incredible. It's sort of profound, you know, it's sort of sad. It's, it, it's basically theater. It's like acting, mm-hmm. you know, he's, he's like, he's, you know what I mean? Like he's reacting to things like, oh God, you know, stuff like that. And so, you know what I mean? Would do, would you make that trade, Dan? Would you trade the, the fun for the, like such amazing poetic lyricism? Yeah. I mean, I, I, I like the fun and stuff of 36 chambers, but you know, it, that was sort of like the theme and everything of that record, you know, was like I said, like. It seems like a you know a party thing, a thing for for live uh, enjoyment. Yeah. Whereas this record doesn't seem like that. Like, it's not really like a negative that this one's missing it. It's just, you know, I guess it's sort of you know I, I we sort of said it is a negative. I'm trying not to uh, contradict hard, myself, yeah. but but you know like it it feels like ah uh, you know I sort of wish I had that because I, I enjoyed it so much. But when you really think about it, like I mean things like that ghost uh, ghost face um, verse, you know, it's sort of like um it, it's looking forward to like what what will become you know like supreme clientele like i, I think that verse is like a really you know s- yeah. sample of that song or i mean that that record and uh in, in my list of of all the uh the, the records I, I put together you know i only did the first phase but supreme clientele is probably you know my second or third favorite like wu-tang record ever um uh, uh. you know so so i really like do enjoy that that style but it it is a trade off, but yeah, one I'm willing to make, I guess. All right, well, Darren, I know you said that it's pretty consistent, but was there any were there any low lights here, like really um, <coughs> black shampoo? Any like thing <laughs> that really just sucked ass? <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah, black shampoo was not not great at all. Um, <laughs> I mean, I know you guys, I know you guys like ODB, but I, I wasn't like a huge fan of of dog shit really wow um hates fun i don't know <laughs> yeah exactly <laughs> <laughs> yeah well yeah i i've got that for been that way for years right um <laughs> yeah I, you know i kind of got sick and tired it's so, like every time i started the you know when i when i try to listen to this record obviously i try to start from the beginning so i feel like i listened to like woo revolution and like reunited like so much and like reunited <laughs> yeah. is good but woo revolution uh-huh. was like I kind of got sick of like having to go through that over and over again. Th- yes. Um, Thank you for, I do, for bringing that up. <laughs> I, I do. I do love though, when I don't know which one it is or who says it, but the guy who's like kind of just saying a lot of stuff and he's like, you know, uh, he's like, uh, 
Martin Luther King. And then he just starts shouting like, <laughs> Malcolm X. And then he's like, there is only one God. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, no, but that. But why yeah, is why is that intro six minutes and forty six yeah. seconds long? Yeah. It's ridiculous. <laughs> I, to be honest, like it's completely. I hate skipping tracks on records. I never do it. But I, anytime I listen to this record, uh, it begins with reunited. I cannot listen <laughs> to. He's just <laughs> he's just babbling about shit that doesn't make any sense. He's saying evolution's not real. That pisses me off. Yeah, yeah. I can't. I, I can't listen to it. It's uh, to be honest. You know, uh, over this two weeks of us, you know, listening to this record, I listened. To, I, I forced myself because I haven't heard it in years to listen uh, to it. I, I listened to it one time. I couldn't. I, I can't. Wow. I, I start with I reunited. Always, this record starts with I, reunited. I probably should have done I, that. Yeah. I always uh, I always start with it. Um, I like the beat, you know, and there are some funny bits. Um, you know, it's I, I got to say I had the opposite uh, reaction because after two weeks, I no longer believe in evolution. <laughs> uh, vaccine. Uh, don't believe in vaccines anymore. They're, you know, it's a government conspiracy. You know, I'm just like I'm sold. But no, I mean, it's a, what a ballsy move to start your record this way with no Wu-Tang members on it. It's just a uh, well, and I want to talk about the themes in a minute, but you got to admit that you know that track is a lot better than second coming at the end of the album which is uh, like yeah. i hate this woman singing um oh, what's her name yeah. or yeah. whatever and it's like you know it's funny i don't think it's supposed to be but it's hilarious you know th- that she's singing about like this album was the second coming <laughs> and it saved hip hop you know <laughs> changed and, the game forever yeah uh, oh my god i mean so that's that's a low light for me. I mentioned Black Shampoo, which just sucks oh, and just yeah. really sucks because Heaters is such a great closer and I don't know why we need it. Um, yeah, so really consistent with like a couple sudden sudden low lights. I hate the song uh, The City, which is like for some reason a Inspected Deck solo song not produced by the RZA and the this annoying like synth strings it sounds so shitty and the beat just like like the song ends at like two minutes 30 seconds and then it just runs for another minute and a half yeah. just the beat just going you know um did you ever feel like that like sometimes you know so one thing i want to ask is like a lot of people say this album has amazingly like no filler okay and i think we've kind of reacted in that way because the the quality is overall very high but it's impossible to say that it doesn't have filler right and doesn't it feel kind of like songs sometimes like or almost every time have filler themselves like does that violin solo need to be so long at the end of reunited you know what i mean i actually i like that that violin solo on reunited okay. it, it's it's like so weird and like you don't expect it but it, it does go on a little long but yeah things like the city like the beat just go you know you're waiting for somebody else to jump on and you know nobody ever does i i think it happens on a, another track or, or two like things like that yeah like the, there is sort of filler within the the songs I think it's impossible to make a two plus hour, uh, you know, album that has this many, you know, tracks on it to not have any filler whatsoever. Yes. I mean, like yes. you said, if this if this ended at heaters, we'd be we'd be great. Black shampoo is maybe one of the worst things ever. <laughs> Second coming is like an outro sort of thing, but then there's an outro, an actual outro. <laughs> right. um, you know, so there's like basically three outros. Um, which is unnecessary. <laughs> I, I do yeah. like the intro to the second disc, and in fact, I wish that was the intro to like the album. Yes, I like it too. For some reason, it's cool because it's like teasing the um, triumph, you know, beat. Sort yeah, of, and, like underneath him. And I just love like you know Riza, like Yana, and then like Jizza. Like it, it seems like they're just like sitting at home and have like have a tape recorder. <laughs> yeah, like Jizza's yeah. like, nah, I, you know, I've I've got some gripes as well. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Because he's just like throwing it off the top of his head, right? Because he's yeah, like, exactly. hey, Doctor Seuss looking. You know, <laughs> it's like very obvious yeah. he doesn't like have planned what he's gonna say. <laughs> I love it. I love it also because it, it it helps me know that we're going to the second yeah, side of this. Yeah, record. exactly. <laughs> it's great, yeah, yeah, it's weird because I, I do kind of wish it was the intro to the whole album because it feels like a better mission statement than. Wu Revolution. Yeah. And I want to kind of talk about that. You know, so it, it, the theme of this record, is it possible to 
you know, identify a theme because Woo Revolution basically gives you this, you know, I don't want to get too much into it because I don't really know what the fuck I'm talking about, but the 5% nation is some sort of like offshoot of the nation of Islam. Um, you know, it, it, it seems to talk a lot about like black brotherhood and there are a lot of themes throughout the album that deal with like, you know, being against like black on black violence and, you know, stuff like stuff, like vaguely religious stuff like that. And, and, you know, stuff like, um, you know, whatever, like, uh, black people used to be Kings or they have the blood of Kings in them, or, you know, there's all this kind of stuff. Um, so that's kind of running through here at the same time. And it's fitting that we get a basically second intro. Like we said, there is like a second mission statement to this album, which is like, you know, fuck mainstream rap, you know? And I, like I was saying, triumph is kind of like the embodiment of this idea, but like fuck choruses, fuck R and B hooks on your rap songs. Um, you know, it's basically an attack, right, on, like, bad boy rap, mm-hmm. which was big at the time. Um, you know, it, it feels kind of punk in that way. Are you on board with that at all, Darren? It's it's like a direct challenge to the kind of, like, Puff Daddy rap that was really blowing up at this time. Yeah, definitely. I mean, I, that's kind of what I was, in, you know, envisioning throughout that entire, like, intro thing. Like, that's what I imagine they were talking about because this is so the opposite of all of that stuff yeah like um, rapping a fashion show you know and stuff like that right he's saying while they own a a, a clothing line <laughs> <laughs> it, it is true there's a, again the contradictions but yeah so you know do are you you know what i mean like it's weird that there are two mission statements here what do you think is like the predominant theme is it really about saving rap more than you know this religious stuff and if so it, it does seem right like the intro track should actually be the intro to the whole album yeah i i mean maybe it's because i don't really know much about that five percenter stuff like it, literally everything i know of it is like from wu-tang things um <laughs> right so maybe i'm just missing it and i don't you know it's going over my head but yeah it does sort of seem like like the second intro is the more like relevant and i mean uh, to be honest if i had never heard of wu-tang so i never heard of them before and i listened to this record for the first time and i heard Wu revolution and i you know heard this anti-evolution crap and stuff i would turn that off and never check it out like i would <laughs> oh, never no. i would never make it to reunited you know like I, I would be like this is not gonna be for me especially if i saw that it was two and a half hours long you know um so i think yeah. i think it's really off i mean i guess they're assuming you know basically nobody would come to this record first you know so right, right. you know maybe it's a ballsy move and i guess i can respect that a little bit but I just I think it's a it's a ballsy move that there's like really no I don't feel like there's any payoff for you know like it's just ballsy for for ballsy's sake. I mean, so it kind of feels maybe like they know that the whole world is listening, right? Right, and that this is like the chance. And that's another thing that I find another fascinating contradiction of this album is that they are both engaging in like world takeover you know it feels like that's their aim like to dominate the rap world to change rap forever to invade the radio with six minute songs you know um and spread these messages they want and yet it also feels so anti-commercial at the same time like you know fuck the radio you know like you know what i'm saying darren like how do you square these two aims yeah i don't know i just i i just don't think that whatever they were laying out with Wu Revolution, <clears throat> I just don't think that that was at all carried out in the rest of the album, you know? I feel okay. like the album is really about, like, all right, let's 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 try to redirect, you know, where hip-hop is going, and only we can do it because of what's happened in the last, like, five years. They had already, you know, they're at the top of the mountain, and now they're coming down to, to you know, correct what whatever corruption is going on, you know what I mean? And I think... I don't know. I just feel like the entire album is is kind of about that. I don't really see the the Wu Revolution thing is just really out there <laughs> and really strange. Yeah, I guess there's no way really to to save that. Um, but it is weird, right, Dan? Where it's like there's something about the Wu Tang identity, which is really outsider. You know, like they're from uh, you know Staten Island and not you know the Bronx or Queens or whatever where all rap comes from you know they're like outsiders they're weird they're into kung fu movies um 
you know, they like make comic book references a lot, um, which you could never imagine, like Tupac, yeah. you know, talking about his favorite comic book character or whatever. <laughs> you know, like they're kind of they're kind of like weird geeks and oh, they mentioned Luke philosophy. Skywalker too, don't they? I forgot about yeah, that. They, they, yeah, they're into they're into chess, like really into chess. <laughs> um and so and I always find myself, you know, I, I just think it's so weird. Like when I listen to liquid swords or something i'm like i can't believe this is so famous because it's weird as hell Mm -hmm. it's like so dark and you know complicated and everything and and yet here it feels like the aim is not to be outsiders anymore to be there but do you get what i'm why i'm so confused then that it is so brazenly anti-commercial well i think it's you know what i mean Dan. i think it's like embracing being outsiders um but like in a way that it's like we it's it's so great that the radio and the mainstream has no choice but to accept it and and to yeah. you know they they had i'm sure like the radio stations weren't like oh, yeah we'll play triumph i'm sure like you know they're like oh six minute <laughs> you know no no hook you know <laughs> yeah. no thank you but then people it, you know demanded it uh, you know at this time like calling a radio station and requesting stuff like actually worked and and everything and i'm i feel like it's just like they're outsiders and everything, but it's just like the through sheer like uh, willpower of of their fan base and and themselves. You know, they've like pushed themselves into the mainstream. You know, it's like yeah, it, it, it's like you know the few punk bands that got you know real fame. You know, like the Ramones are super famous and stuff. You know, it, it like feels like sort of like it, it, like that kind of thing. Yeah, I just feel like it's. I feel a little bit of never mind. In this album, yeah. which is like, let's take over the world and a little bit of in utero at the same time, which is like, fuck fame. I don't want anybody listening to this. I don't want to be on the radio. You know what I mean, Darren? Yeah, I don't know. I, I mean, I feel like <clears throat> I think of like how crazy it must have been when, uh, you know, like the Beatles released like Hey Jude. Like it's a great pop song, but it's also like yeah. six and a half, seven minutes long or whatever, which is just crazy to think that it became a number one single. But, you know, then again, at that point in their careers, I think the Beatles could have done whatever they wanted and people would have had no choice um, but to accept it. So similar to kind of like what you were saying, Dan, like, I think they just sort of were able to command that. Like, why would we try to bow down to what the mainstream wants with like a three and a half minute song with choruses and all this kind of stuff? Like, we're already we're we're above that and people are going to demand it no matter what we do. So I think. I think Triumph was like the first single, right? Like, <laughs> yeah, it was. I mean, that's that's just like yeah. a slap in the face to everything that was popular in the the industry, right? If you put something out like that, I mean, it goes against the grain, and I think that's kind of what they were hoping to do, right? Yeah, yeah. I just I, I just can't get over how interesting it is because actually Triumph has like this really amazing music video that apparently costs like eight hundred thousand bucks or something, and it's got like CGI in it and everything, <laughs> and um. It's like, you know, again, like that simultaneous, like we want to be successful and take over the mainstream, but totally on our own terms. I mean, I think it's, we're all lucky that they didn't, you know, try to go bad boy or try to sound like Dr. Dre, you know, um, Tupac and make a success that way, you know? Um, but okay. So in regard to like the album structure, all right, I guess it's hard to figure out we're kind of, like we can tell that there's some theme running through this whole thing, but it's a little confusing, hard to make sense of Woo Revolution. Do you feel like this is basically my, my my first question is like why is disc two so much longer than disc one? Like, doesn't that feel purposeful? Do you feel at all like and and you know disc two? It's got the intro, which is about anti mainstream rap, and then it's got the closing, which is also like Raekwon's thoughts on mainstream rap. You know and do you feel like the first disc has more of like a social justice theme, like a lot more stuff about street violence and stuff. And that disc two is a lot more focused on the, you know, mainstream rap thing. Do you feel like there's any sense to be made about why the record is organized the way it is? I mean, I feel like it's, it's kind of has to be a purposeful choice, you know, because it's not even really like closely close to being evenly split you know the first disc is 45 minutes second disc is 67 and change yeah you know like that that's that seems like there's got to be a purpose behind that it it almost like it's almost like is the first disc sort of like that's the album and then the second disc is like 
the bonus, you know, but but then why is Triumph on the second disc, you know? Like so it sort of yeah, doesn't feel, it doesn't like, feel that. like Triumph Triumph fits the theme yeah, of Yeah, th- that that's a good point. It does fit of that industry. Yeah. Yeah, so may- maybe that is the thing and maybe they just had more uh material on on the the second uh sort of. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, I mean maybe that that could be it, yeah. That's a good point. Are you able to make any sense of that, Darren, like the layout here? I mean, I didn't really think about it while listening, but the way, but you, you know, you're absolutely right. I guess I didn't even realize how short the first half was um, compared to the second half. But um, yeah, I mean, just kind of looking over the tracks and thinking about them right now, like, I feel like you're actually kind of right. Like, it does seem like the second half really is about, you know, just changing the game right and and doing it in their own way i mean we've already mentioned like the mgm and like duck season and like we already talked about triumph and stuff like all of those tracks i think seem to belong together if you were to think about the second half as being like thematic in that way um and i guess that would be why because i mean obviously like you mentioned i mean obviously if if we were trying to split it evenly you could have just taken some of these tracks and thrown them on the, f- the front end but uh maybe yeah. that would have changed the feel um because you know when i when i listen to a lot of double records you know the second half in a lot of them you start getting a little worn out right but with uh with this album i feel like the second half is things like really get picked up again like they right after the intro into triumph and everything like i feel like you're sort of like rejuvenated um going into the second half yeah yeah towards the end obviously it gets a little bit much with like the, the triple closer or whatever but right 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 <laughs> everything before yeah, that is like you know fire right it feels a little bit like they're supposed to work on their own i don't know that either really does but you know like if you think about like a better tomorrow um which i think is really a highlight here um it's got that like emotional woo like wu-tang is they'll do that sometimes you know um can it can it be also simple or in those kind of tracks like um talking about street issues and like real real shit like that um and then ending on it's yours it feels sort of like something related to woo revolution you know or the themes there um so there's some sense there but there's something odd about it now we talked um we haven't talked about what i think is kind of strange here is like something like a lack maybe maybe you don't even agree a lack of these sort of skits and samples that uh mutang is known for like the kung fu stuff comes through a little bit but not so much and when it's there it feels a little lazy you know it almost feels like just sort of added on like hey we're still the wu-tang clan and yet i also kind of miss it because there are some times where it's just like this huge beat is going we should mention like every song is just basically like five or six minutes of just the straight looping beat and sometimes in between rappers there's just an awkward just nothing of like mm-hmm. the beat just looping you know and and that's where you would expect it to come in with like you know pia, 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 you know or something <laughs> right do you kind of miss that stuff uh how would you explain like the lack of that stuff dan yeah i do miss it a little bit because because you're right there there are like some places on it that seem sort of ripe for uh that sort of addition um you know, I mean, maybe Rizzo didn't want to get, like, pigeonholed of, like, oh, you know, you gotta have the, you know, kung fu kind of <laughs> yeah, thing. Every song. Yeah, so, like, I could I could see... Like, the, Godspeed with, like, you know, talking exactly. sample or something. Exactly. You know? exactly. You know, they haven't done that for, like, three or four records, and still, every time they release a goddamn record, people complain about that. And, yeah, you know, right. so I could I could see, like, Rizzo not wanting to get, like, pigeonholed into that. And that's, that. you know, that's respectable. As, as the skits go, you know... Uh, I've talked about it before. Like hip hop skits are like skits on hip hop records is like one of the worst creations uh, that's ever (laughs) happened in the world, you know, but the ones on 36 chambers are the, some of the only ones that like to this day, I, I rarely skip, you know, they're, they're still funny. You know, torture is still one of the like funniest things, um, you know, you've ever heard on a record and stuff, but here they sort of, uh, on this record forever they uh they're they're closer to that annoying like thing you know like um i can't remember what song it's right in front of but like you know they're talking about uh smoking outside and the, you know the cops come up and then they're getting shouted at by the cop and shouting back and stuff it's just a little like you know i don't want to hear that every time i listen to this record it's sort of just annoying you know like none of the skits like 
stick out to me. You know, like I, it's hard to even like remember uh, a lot of them, and they're just sort of pointless or yeah, you know, tacked on. Whereas on Thirty Six Chambers, they feel you know, like the the radio call in, you know, for like protect your neck. Right, like that right, that is right. like purposeful. The the one with like Method Man like explaining all the members of the Wu. You know, like that's purposeful. It, it's you know, it it. it the record would suffer, I think, if those like things were were missing. Whereas, yeah. like here and here, I don't think anything yeah, you know, would, like, would suffer. Yeah, I think about something like at the end of Dog Shit. You know, Dog Shit actually ends like a minute early, and then you get this admittedly pretty funny thing where this guy is like just dissing somebody. You know, like your shirt looks. Like oh, a that one is funny. You know, yeah. <laughs> it's it's funny, and you're like, I'm kind of like, oh, this reminds me of Thirty Six Chambers when I'm like laughing with them and just having fun and hanging out or whatever. But it just kind of feels like too little too late or something it's kind of like the only skit like that and you don't get that vibe of like i'm in the basement with rizza and the wu-tang clan hanging yeah, out exactly. you know, while they make this record you know so yeah same with the uh with the kung fu samples which it feels like there's just a couple here but like just not enough to make it a cohesive thing um i want to keep moving on and i just want to mention you know that for some reason in uh, at this exact time we get the like birth of the rap double lp so 1996 we get the first one tupac's all eyes on me we talked about that on our previous podcast um the following year we get notorious big's life after death and then a little bit later that year we get this album uh wu-tang forever so all of a sudden these huge releases and you know i kind of feel like there are different aims here because it's you know you obviously get two records sold and it just feels like rap is consciously trying to take over the world i think that's kind of like what tupac is trying to do that's like what biggie is trying to do um here i think it's there's something very interesting about listening to this in 2019 maybe you'll agree with me darren but it feels like an attempt to make an event release a lot of these double albums like this is an event you gotta buy it you gotta listen to it but doesn't it feel kind of like a comic book movie today where you get the solo albums and then everybody comes for like the, you know, the reunion album, like yeah. when they're all in the same movie, you know, like it's kind of amazing. And it's amazing that more musicians don't do this. Maybe they just don't have the talent, but isn't that kind of interesting, Darren? Yeah, actually it is. Um, <laughs> I guess I, I suppose like, uh, you know all those solo Wu-Tang albums would be like, you know, the Iron Man's and the Thor's or whatever. And then this (laughs) is like the Avengers moment and stuff. Um, I mean, I think it's like super cool, but I think you're right. I I just don't think there's enough talent out there to like be able to do that sort of thing. I mean, look no further than like, uh, you know, like DC movies, right? Because like they have attempted to try to, you know, do the same thing with like Batman and Superman and everything. But yet, yeah, all those movies like kind of tanked. So I, I mean, I just don't think that it's, it's pretty like uh ballsy i feel like to do that right i mean come out as a group and then just do a bunch of individual solo albums banking on the fact that like each one of them are going to do well enough to warrant you know another yeah. group album like this right but it's interesting that rizza like understood what it then took hollywood like an additional you know decade or yeah. two to figure out which yeah. is like this is how you get people's asses into seats. Like you make it an event, you know, like you, you make, you build a universe and then you like bring it all together. You know, it's, <laughs> I think, I just think it's like honestly fascinating. Um, so sort of beginning to wrap up our conversation here, did you find yourself enjoying this album, Darren? Are you converted to this album being underrated? I think so. Um, I'm actually very surprised that it's, you <laughs> I know, too. you know, I, reading like the, the quietest, uh, you know, I guess review or anniversary review or whatever thing. Yeah. yeah. I was just a little taken back by just how sort of negative it seemed. Right. Um, yeah. Yeah. I mean, I thought, I, I just think that this is like a fantastic record and, um, I mean, I, I don't, I don't know how else to describe it. Like, I just think it's, it's great. I mean, there's obviously a few low points. I mean, that's kind of a, you know, again, going back to Dan's comment about two, a two hour long album, like there's going to be some low points in it. Right. But, uh, yeah, I mean, I'm all sure of there's that... some Marvel movies that suck oh, the lead up to the Hell yes. <laughs> hell yes. Some awful <laughs> ones, actually. <laughs> yeah. So black shampoo is like, uh, Captain Marvel or something like yeah. that. Maybe I, Iron I, Man I three, really maybe <laughs> yeah, okay, yeah. <laughs> not the one with ACDC music in it. though. <laughs> How did you feel revisiting this, um, Dan? You know, we talked at the top, like me and you both said that, like, 
as big of like Wu Tang fans as we as we are, we we still feel like we there was something to like dig into with this record. And you know, so I really like enjoyed finally like you know for like I ne- I never like w- besides having a podcast would like listen to a two hour album you know over and over and over and over again for yeah, for two yeah. weeks. Um, so I like. I was worried, you know, at the start of that, I was, I was sort of worried about like having the stamina to to keep doing that, um, and I ended up like enjoying it to the point where like I I listened to it like more than I even like really you know needed to and stuff, you know, like I I would I, I found myself like the other night I was like oh you know I'll listen to Cuban Links and and you know uh, you maybe Liquid at Swords yeah. or something and then I found myself being like you know I sort of I sort of want to hear Triumph you know like I found myself like yeah, sort of like wanting yeah. to come back to to this record so I think it it sort of gave me like um a, a deeper and enjo- I've I've always enjoyed this record I've never disliked it but I think this is this has given me like a deeper enjoyment of it yeah I mean I, I found again like a, a final contradiction here you know that the lyrics really reward close mm-hmm. listening because they're so dense. And yet the album is also awesome for just putting on in the background because like maybe even more than any Wu-Tang album, because the beats are just so good and they just, they don't really change. They're just like consistent, like practical things for these, you know, verses and the flows are just always so good that it's just kind of awesome to have on and just like kind of hang out. I think it's, it's, it's a really cool record for that in some way. Um, so I was really struck by that. I did find that, yeah, I think this might be the first time in my life that I've just like, m- like many, many times actually put, you know, started Woo Revolution and listened all the way through <laughs> to the closing in one Oof. sitting, you know, I mean, and it's funny because you, you, you listen to the first disc and it actually is pretty tight, it feels. And then, and then you're like, well, I'm not going to stop before I get to triumph, you know? And then it's like, once you're there, you're like, well, impossible is really good too. And then you yeah, just kind of yeah, like yeah. go, you just kind of find yourself going the rest of the way through. And you know, maybe you stop at black shampoo, but <laughs> it really works. It really, it really works. Do you think it deserves to be kind of grouped in that first phase? Like, you know, that classic phase of Wu-Tang clan. Ah, uh, I mean, it's technically still part of the five year plan. So in that regard, yes, but I feel like it's sort of also like this marks the like second phase. Um, yeah. So do you feel like it holds a candle to any of those records we mentioned? At the I top? mean, you know, in, in, in my listing, I did, I, I, I put this one as second to, to worst, uh, to Cal being the only one that I think is l- less good oh, okay. as this, but I mean, if you're gonna have five records in front of you, the the five in front of you would would you would want would be would be these five, you know, like the, those are all yeah. like solid, I ten out of ten like classic. There's some of, some of my favorite uh-huh. records like in all of music, not not just hip hop and not just Wu Tang records, you know. So, I mean, this one this one's not a ten out of ten, you know, but it's still it's still up there. It's still a great record, you know. I I feel you know it's not as good as those, but that you know that sounds worse than it is you know it's 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 still great it's just not as good as some of the best records ever made (laughs) you know yeah okay final question darren would you cut songs from this um or does that kind of defeat the point you know i always kind of hate when people say like about double albums like oh you could make it into a great single disc because it always feels like the ambition behind the giant product is a major Mm -hmm. part and this album just like a lot of those you know it's like that's the takeover is that it's so huge you know so would you cut songs from this i i wouldn't i wouldn't actually um okay i know you guys hate on like black shampoo and everything but like i i just feel like you know kind of like what you're mentioning like when you when you are investing into a two hour long listening experience like you're gonna take the lows with the highs you know what i mean especially if the album is as good as it as this one is right i mean um it's it's almost like listening to i mean any any double album you could try to have this argument like the white album you know pavements uh, uh wowie yeah. zowie right like you could do that but the, the but crappy sh- songs are important yeah they, they're kind of what puts this entire thing together like when we describe it as like sprawling and everybody has lanes and everybody has room like all of that wouldn't be there if you cut you know 30 percent of the record away like then suddenly it would feel so tight and like we'd be having a, an, an entirely different conversation and mm-hmm. i i just i think it defeats you know the the vision and the, the purpose of of like having a sprawling record i i i love it and i would i wouldn't change any of it 
Yeah. Weirdly, you know, again, a contradiction here. I, I feel like cutting anything, even black shampoo, you would just make this a worse album. I don't know how that w- happens, but <laughs> it defies all science and logic, but somehow that, that's the case. Um, anything else or should we move on to these emails? Let's go. All right. So a reminder, you can email us anything that's on your mind, popshieldpod at gmail.com. And like I mentioned last week, we're always looking for topic ideas. So send those our way as well. Um, Our first email is from Jerry in regard to our episode on Neutral Milk Hotels on Avery Island. I can't read the whole thing because it was super detailed, which is awesome. By the way, I did enjoy reading it. But he says, one particular gripe I have with the album is I, uh, that I don't understand is how en- the ending track, Pre Sister, seems to ruin the album, even though it's placed right at the end. You could just skip it or opt not to listen to it if you choose. He argues that it's different from Olivia Tremor Control's punishingly experimental tracks because it comes at the end of the album and is meant to function like a coda or even credit music as you're leaving the theater, for example. So we talked a little bit about this. What do you guys think about that? Does that like give you the willies a little bit to think like, uh, this is okay for me to just walk away and not, you know, listen to the whole thing. I, I like the, I, I never thought about that, but I, I like the idea of the like credit music uh, aspect of it. Um, you know, I, I, I think I said during that episode, you know, I, I like pre sisters, but I, I like experimental music and stuff. But I said too, like, you know, when you listen to it in the car, I turn it off, you know, I don't, I don't make everybody sit through it and stuff, you know? So, I, it doesn't really give me like the the willies to to do that. Um, I, 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 I yeah, I, I think I I, li- I really like the idea of of the the credit music thing, and I think he's right too when he says like the Olivia Trimmer control ones are like sort of worse because you're you're forced to sit through those. You know, they're they're dead in the middle, scattered all throughout. You know, like there's there's or no maybe not even them. worse, but it's just like it's very clear that the Olivia Trimmer control they want you to sit through the whole. Yeah, thing. yeah. When I say worse, I don't. Not really a good choice of words, but yeah, yeah, what what, what you meant. <laughs> what do you think, Darren? I mean, do you think Jeff Mangum wants you to sit through all the pre-sisters, or he's okay if you, like, walk away and get a snack or something? Hmm. I mean, I imagine he wouldn't put it on the record if he didn't want you to hear it, but, um, hmm. you know, I, I still stand by the fact that I, I feel like it doesn't really belong um, and that I don't really want to listen to it. I, I wouldn't really necessarily advocate for, like, <laughs> you know, removing it from the album or anything like that entirely. Uh, especially because, you know, to uh, to uh, Jerry's point, like, it's at the end of the record, and you, it's kind of up to you what you want to do with it. And I feel like one listen through it is going to give you all that you really need, and then at that point, if you, you know, want to continue to enjoy it, then that's fine. But I just, I, I don't know. Um, I like the idea of it being, like, credit music, because, like, like, really, you kind of, to me, I, I sort of, like, zone out. Like, at that point, like, once couple minutes into it i'm just like whoa you know what what am i doing you know i'm not if i'm focusing if i'm trying to focus on what i'm listening to i'm probably going to stop listening if i'm not really focusing and it's just kind of on in the background i could totally see just leaving it there and not really you know paying much attention and i think it kind of it's it's fine like that but i mean you know i at the end of the day the rest of the record is 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 pretty great this is not well do you feel like It's not fair, actually not fair, like Jerry says, to deduct points because it comes at the end and you don't have to listen. Or do you feel like you you have to judge? You have to include it. I mean, you're judging. It's part of the album, (laughs) right? I mean, yeah, right. It's not a B side. It's not a bonus track. It's you know the last track of this album. It is the last statement of On Avery Island. So yeah, I think you. I mean, I guess I consider it. I I do like kind of love the magic of credit music in a movie. And it actually serves a function where you're leaving the theater and you, you know, you're, you're leaving like Iron Man 2 and you hear like, I'm on a highway <laughs> to hell. And, and you, you hear that kind of like fading as you exit the room, you know, and uh, there's something really fun about that. But um, I just feel like music doesn't exactly work that way. Like, where, where am I going? Where am I walking away to? You know, like right, I'm sitting exactly. at my desk. Like, <laughs> yeah. So <laughs> good point. You know, I got to put the put the record away. So, you know, so I, I guess I, I felt a little divided. Um, the second part, I do want to read in full. Jerry says, on another note, one chilling interpretation of Pre Sisters that has stuck with me is that the entire thing is a musical depiction of a slow descent into hell. Mangum had said that he wrote the song with the intent of depicting what he thought humans would hear after they died, which supports this particular morbid reading of the track when April 8th ends with a loud bang. It's as if there's a gunshot suicide at the end of the song, and then the rest of Pre Sisters is just a terrifyingly long, hellish chime underscored by malevolent noise and drone that depicts a slow descent into hell. 
want to get your guys take on that interpretation but dan did you you watch this like strange elephant six documentary that came out and it had something to say about pre-sisters yeah um it, it's the uh the future history of the elephant six recording company it's called you know, people probably seen like articles it's this thing that you're only supposed to be able to get on vhs through the mail well uh finally mm-hmm. somebody put it on the goddamn internet um and i found it um but yeah i watched it and um will cullen hart like talks about making or um, i'm sorry uh, robert schneider like talks about uh making this uh, this um song he said it was like a uh jeff had this ba- uh, banjo lp and it had like a, a natural skip like in there like the record was fucked up and so they put it on and it you know it, it's that loop that you hear at the beginning um and that was just the natural you know skip of it and then they just kept taking it and like slowing it down a little bit more and a little bit more and a little bit more and mm-hmm. then uh, schneider said that like eventually uh it was like so slow that all these like weird harmonics were coming through and everything you know sort of like a uh I, i'm speaking you know in a room thing you know Luc- lucier um he yeah, said yeah. but schneider said that like they got to this point where like all the cats in the house like came in the room and were like really freaked out <laughs> and he said that they were both like yeah you you know that that's that's a that's what we wanted you know like the this this making the cats freak out uh kind of thing um so i don't know i i've never heard that uh particular mangum uh story that that he um uh emailed us um I, I, you know i i sort of complained uh i think it was last episode or something uh yeah yeah during the burial one like when you make up like these little stories and it doesn't really like the author didn't say it you know it's fun you can you can right. believe that i don't i don't i don't particularly hear it but yeah i mean i i did say during the episode that i, I think it's really cool how it feels like this dark undercurrent is kind of threatening to happen the whole album and then it finally does i really like that and that's more of like a you know that's not like a fixing a interpretation to it just that like sonically yeah. it works for me but i think it's kind of fun like there's something about certain albums and something about the elephant six in particular we talked about this with olivia tremor control that just sort of invites you to do this like weird interpretive detective work you know what i mean darren where you're just kind of like oh the black foliage that means like dreams but like when you're dead you know or like this is supposed to be like the you know like there's something fun about that and i think it's almost true to the spirit of the this psychedelic scene that happened in athens and everything where it's like yeah dive into it and come up with some crazy theory while you're you know on acid or whatever oh yeah for sure i I mean i think airplane uh kind of also invites that sort of interpretation Mm -hmm. even though we you know have some loose understanding right but i mean uh to this you know interpretation i mean i could i could buy into that you know i don't i don't see anything necessarily wrong with it it doesn't necessarily come out that way you know to me but you know i imagine making some you know noise like this you know there's there's some sort of intent to it and what you described dan sounds interesting like you're just kind of pushing sound until something comes out right something weird happens right and i think that whatever that is like you don't necessarily have to be able to define it or um you know be able to give it a a very specific definition i think that's the kind of point of like experimentation right you're just kind of always trying mm -hmm. to push push things to its limit and beyond and see see what happens and it doesn't necessarily have to have a very clear you know that's why you don't put lyrics over it right like you don't give it anything specific it's just not meant to to be like that yeah, and I guess like a lot of experimental music, it feels like it's trying to paint a picture. And if you were looking at a very abstract painting, that's like part of what you're supposed to do is be like, oh, this makes me think of this. This right, makes me think right. of this. I see this, you know. Um, okay, one more quick email from Jackson who says we should absolutely dedicate an episode to discussing Vampire Weekend, as Darren suggested. Um, what do you guys think? He says Modern Vampires of the City is his favorite, but it sounds like, Darren, you're kind of into Father of the Bride right now. Yeah, I'm very much into Father of the Bride, though. I, I would probably um, agree with Jackson that Modern Vampires of the City might be the best Vampire Weekend uh, record. Well, I think we should definitely do a Vampire Weekend episode um, because you've been, seems like, dying to do it for a while. Uh, one idea I had was just force Dan to listen to their entire discography. What I love do you it. Think? Yeah, I love it. God, I'm going to be <laughs> a great uh, idea. Maybe I'll end up loving it. I'll buy a bunch of polo shirts and get some boat shoes. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe. 
All right. Well, I think that's enough for this week. So we would like to hear your thoughts. We'll read them on the air. Uh, emails, popshieldpod at gmail.com. Next episode in two weeks. Not entirely sure yet. Maybe Kanye, uh, if, if a miracle happens and we, <laughs> yeah. we get a record. No, Probably not. If you like the show, though, help us out. Subscribe. Leave us a five-star review uh, wherever you get your podcasts. And stay connected. Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, all that junk is at popshieldpod. And we'll see you in two weeks. See ya. So long. 